As some of you know, I was going to talk about time in poetry, but I didn't have enough time this time to talk about time. So I'm going to talk about something that is very dear to my heart because it's about a book that's just being born. It's actually not out yet, even though it is in the bookstore. It's being born on January 27th. So I'm going to talk about where journeys. Poetry has taken me many places. It takes all poets many places, some of them are physical places. In April 2012, I traveled to Libya, a country emerging from the uprising that overthrew the brutal 42-year dictatorship of Colonel Omar Gaddafi. The ruins left by NATO airstrikes on Tripoli had not yet been cleared. Vast swaths of the city lay in rubble. At that time, there was no police force, no garbage pickup, no postal service. There still isn't. The government was provisional, put in place to prepare for elections. But the first public event planned in Tripoli in the war's aftermath by the Provisional Ministry of Culture was an international poetry reading to be held in the open air, under the stars, near the ancient Roman ruin of the Marcus Aurelius Arch. I was among the 22 poets who came, most from Arabic-speaking countries, most in Libya for the first time, and among our Libyan hosts were poets and writers who had at one time or another been imprisoned by Gaddafi. The first thing I noticed was that posters for our reading had been slapped on the bullet-riddled walls all over town. The posters covered up the bullet holes. There were spent shell casings strewn all over the ground, in the streets, in the market, everywhere I looked. And in the days that followed, one of the poets even picked up from the troubled earth a box of life, unspent ammunition. The Libyans welcomed us warmly in the hotel, in the streets, in the cafes, and especially on the night of the reading when hundreds came to the arch to sit on folding chairs where booklets of the poems to be read that night had been placed, translated into Arabic. There weren't enough chairs for the crowd that gathered. Children lined up along a wall overlooking the arch, men and women veiled and unveiled, young and old crowded around the arch and into the adjacent streets. Large speakers had been mounted near the podium, the kind that we see at rock concerts. Libyan television crews and also Al Jazeera arrived and set up their cameras. A dozen of their microphones were placed on the podium. Armed militia were everywhere in their various uniforms, and, they were, and we were assured that they were there to provide our security. They smiled at us and gave us, up, gave us thumbs up and peace signs. On the walls, there was graffiti having to do with the victory over the dictatorship. One read in English, hold your heads up, you are free Libyans. Several English-speaking Libyans approached and expressed their gratitude to the United States and to NATO for the airstrikes that helped them to defeat Gaddafi. I had given only a few open air readings in my life and never under a lighted Roman arch before an audience who would not understand my language. You'll be fine, the poet Zakaria Mohammed assured me. It will be good. I was asked to begin my reading with the poem, The Colonel, written 34 years ago a poem that arose out of an experience I had while working as a human rights activist in El Salvador. I protested that it was a very old poem, but they insisted and assured me, assured me that the poem translated into Arabic well. All right then, I thought, but the poem includes an obscenity, a four-letter word, and I didn't know whether it was all right to use this word in public here. We have our own version of this word, they said. Don't worry. When I finished the poem, there was a murmur through the crowd, and I heard a little automatic weapons fire in the air. The crowd seemed to react to the poem in a way I had not expected. 
with enthusiasm and interest. And it was only in late, and it was not until later that I was told that they heard this poem about a Salvadoran colonel as a poem about the former dictator, Colonel Gaddafi. They translated the sense of the poem not only into Arabic from, from English, but into their time and place. I read several more poems and took my seat. During the rest of the readings, I heard more automatic gunfire. And I must have been looking around a bit anxiously because the Libyan man seated beside me finally leaned over and said, they're firing into the air because they like the poem. Another first for me. I had never heard AK rifle fire as a form of applause. After the readings, the audience members crowded around us, shaking our hands, hugging us, some of them with tears in their eyes. One woman about my age took both of my hands in hers and said, this means we are a normal country, that we can have a poetry reading in our city. We are finally a normal country. Another first. I had never heard it claimed that poetry readings conferred normalcy in human communities, that hosting a poetry reading contributed to the possibility of a future for the city of Tripoli. Months later, the American ambassador to Libya was murdered in Benghazi along with his bodyguards, an act that horrified the people of Libya as it horrified Americans, an act all too frequently committed in the ruins of war's aftermath and in the political labors of a country giving birth to itself for the first time as a parliamentary democracy. In a strange way, I feel that at least in Tripoli, and I still feel this, that they might succeed. And I feel this because of that night when the city gathered to hear poetry in the open air. A month earlier, I had traveled to Hanoi and Hue, Vietnam, with a group of American veterans of the war to be welcomed by a group of Vietnamese veterans who had fought on the other side. These soldiers, 20 years ago, together built the first bridge between their countries in the war's aftermath, quietly making contact with each other through the poetry and stories they were writing about their war experience. The U.S. government had imposed an embargo on trade with Vietnam, and all contact with our countries was cut off. At the same time, the new government of a united Vietnam was deeply suspicious of the United States. Kevin Bowen, a poet and director of the Joyner Center for the Study of War and its Social Consequences at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, led the effort first to provide artificial arms and legs to those Vietnamese maimed during the war, and then to translate the poetry and stories written by Vietnamese veterans. He then invited a few of his former combat enemies to come the, to the United States and give readings as the two governments quietly looked the other way. Kevin Bowen, Bruce Weigel, Yusuf Komonyaka, and others, combat veterans all, then made what they called a full circle journey back to Vietnam to walk the hills, fields, and rice paddies of their violent youth. It was, they, <clears throat> it was then they discovered that the United States possessed, in an archive in Washington, boxes of captured documents papers and small notebooks confiscated from the corpses of dead Vietnamese soldiers during the war, now preserved on microfilm. It was thought that such materials might contain information of military importance, logistical information, and battle plans. The documents, however, were of course written in Vietnamese, so no one among the Americans in the field could ascertain what was important from what wasn't. All were sent to Washington for analysis, assigned a code that corresponded to their intelligence value and eventually warehoused. Kevin Bowen and the other veteran poets pressured to have these boxes opened. And when the captured documents were translated, it was discovered that much of it was poetry written by Vietnamese soldiers love poems to their sweethearts, poems of longing and despair, poems about nature, life, and death. 
the American veteran poets persuaded the United States government to send these microfilm documents back to Vietnam as a gesture of goodwill. They were received with gratitude and conferred an unexpected benefit. The documents helped the Vietnamese to solve their own MIA problem. Soldiers missing in action and never accounted for. Soldiers who could not technically be confirmed dead on the field of battle. Where possible, the documents were returned to these soldiers' families who now, at last, knew the truth about their loved ones. They had something in their grasp that had once been written by their sons, husbands, fathers, and lovers. Many more exchanges were arranged between the writers and the poets in the years that followed. This year was the 20th anniversary of those first tentative steps. The Vietnamese Writers Association invited us back because they wanted to honor Kevin and his fellow poets and writers formally to reach across the horrors of that war, the years of that war, and to celebrate the peace that had been achieved and the strength of the poet's bridge. I had never been to Vietnam. It was for me a place where my first husband and my childhood friends fought, young men from Michigan who were wounded or died in a war I opposed as a young woman marching in the streets of East Lansing and Ann Arbor with other university students, carrying our signs, intellectually uncertain of the war's true dimensions, but feeling in our hearts that it was wrong, and realizing to our horror that our government wasn't telling us the truth, as now has been substantially disclosed. During our stay in Vietnam, we gave poetry readings and visited Buddhist temples and the cemeteries of the war dead, the cemeteries of the 10,000 graves, of which there are many, a sea of gravestones, all the same size, like our Arlington National Cemetery, but gray rather than white, with incense sticks burning beside pots of chrysanthemum. We walked in the now peaceful fields of the former American bases and battlefields, Khe San, Quan Tri, and the former demilitarized zone. It isn't over and it will never be over. We don't live after such experiences as war, but rather in their aftermath, wherein the past is always present, is with us, but we go on toward our future and it goes with us. That sense of past and present converging happens in a good many poems. In a sense, poems can be ghosted language imprinted by extremity, carrying with it in resonant images a darker human suffering. I'm often asked about the role of the writer and the poet in the United States, his or her relation to the public world. This especially occurred when I returned from El Salvador in 1980 and published what was then viewed as a controversial book of poems. What is the role of the poet in society, I was asked. What is our responsibility? During the past few decades, I think the perception of that role has changed somewhat. This may have begun with the fatwa issued by the former Iranian spiritual leader Ayatollah Humala Khomeini against Salman Rushdie on February 14, 1989, for his book Satanic Verses. This fatwa called the literary world to attention over the plight of an author condemned to death for his writing and demanded a response from writers all over the world. In the early hours of that crisis in the United States, we were asked to sign letters and petitions, appear on news broadcasts, and make public our support for Rushdie and our condemnation of the fatwa form of literary censorship, or what V.S. Naipaul called an extreme form of literary criticism. The rallying cry then was, we are all Salman Rushdie. Later that same year, the pro-democracy movement was crushed at Tiananmen Square, and the poet Beidou in Berlin at the time was accused of inciting events as his poetry had appeared on banners held aloft by the demonstrators. In former Czechoslovakia that December, the playwright Václav Havel, three times imprisoned critic of totalitarianism, became president of his country 
And so the momentous year ended with sleigh bells and candlelight in Wenceslas Square. Poets and writers in the United States beheld the spectacle of a novelist forced into hiding, a poet exiled in absentia, and a playwright born on the shoulders of his countrymen as they chanted Havel Nachad to the castle Havel. Beidou began teaching, first in Sweden, then in Denmark, Germany, and the United States. Salman Rushdie was offered protection of Scotland Yard. Václav Havel was invited to address a joint session of the United States Congress on February 21st, 1990. His audience was our legislature, but also the citizens of this republic and the world at a special moment when the burden of totalitarian oppression had been lifted not only from the former Czech lands, but throughout the former Soviet empire. At that time, I was attempting to bring a work to fruition against forgetting 20th century poetry of witness, an anthology of poets from all over the world who had endured extremity during the past century. Well, so it goes on to describe this 145 poets, 30 languages, and it was the culmination of these efforts. As, as the former Soviet empire was breaking apart, I found myself hastily calling newly installed consulates of recently independent republics so as to revise sections having to do with the poets of the former Warsaw Pact. So I would call them up and just ask them what they wanted their country to be called at the moment. The volume is nearly 20 years old this year. It is 20 years old. Well, it turned 20 in 2013. And it will be joined in January 27th by a companion edited, edited together with my friend and colleague, the romanticist scholar Duncan Wu of Georgetown University. When we first began teaching together in 2008, he proposed that I consider reading back through English language poetry to gather works of witness from our own tradition. I hesitated as the first effort had absorbed me for 13 years. But that volume, Poetry of Witness, the Tradition in English 1500 to 2001, will be published by W.W. Norton. Included are 111 poets. And among those who experienced war, imprisonment, torture, exile, religious and political persecution, censorship and execution, and whose works do at least in part constitute evidence of such experience include St. Thomas More, Sir Walter Raleigh, William Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe, Ben Johnson, John Milton, Andrew Marvel, William Blake, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley and Keats, Whitman, Dickinson, and Yeats, and a good number of others you would recognize. They were variously surveilled, accused of treason, sentenced to death by decapitation, and slower, more gruesome deaths. They were kept in solitary confinement, forced to labor on slave ships, traded and owned as slaves, and accused of supporting abolition. They were Catholic when the religion was outlawed, Irish under English rule, Americans nursing Civil War soldiers on the battlefield, and they were soldiers in the trenches of the Great War and those that followed. They were English language poets all, from England and her former colonies. Scarcely a poet until the year 1900 escapes inclusion, even under the strictest of criteria, the strictest being for the past century, that they now be dead. All the poets are dead in the anthology. That there would be so many poets of witness in our tradition, so as to constitute a plurality of voices came as not much of a surprise, but taken together, what we held in our hands was a tome of such weight and such magnitude that it became impossible any longer to read English language poetry other than as a, an inextricably bound to an art marked by the world, by struggle and violence, by opposition to injustice and a willingness to sacrifice personal freedom, well-being, and life itself in the interests of humankind. Citing but a few examples, we begin with St. Thomas More in 1535, who wrote poetry with pieces of coal while confined in the Tower of London, awaiting death by being hung, drawn, and quartered. 
The poem Davy the Dicer was written following a visit by Thomas Cromwell, sent by Henry VIII to soften the saint's feelings toward the king. Despite his imminent death and the ordeal of prison, he expressed gratitude for the hours in which he was free to write poems. In faith, I bless you again a thousand times for lending me now some leisure to make rhymes. These lines were among his last. Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, whom we have to thank for the felicitous invention of blank verse, unrhymed iambic pentameter, that'll be on the test, attempted to escape the Tower of London by crawling down a toilet leading into the Thames, but was caught and later beheaded. Sir Walter Raleigh of myth and legend spent the eve of his beheading writing his last poem. I share with you his last. Even such a time which takes in trust our youth, our joys and all we have, and pays us but with age and dust, who in the dark and silent grave, when we have wandered all our ways, shuts up the story of our days and from which earth and grave and dust, the Lord shall raise me up, I trust. Among the Catholic priests who were poets at the time Elizabeth first made it treasonous to practice anything but the state religion was St. Robert Southwell, Society of Jesus, who was arrested while attempting to say mass at a private residence. He was manacled at the wrists with his feet standing upon the ground and his hands but as high as he can reach against the wall and subjected to a form of torture by which internal injury was inflicted without causing outward marks on the body. Southwell was almost dead when they cut him down. He spent the t next two and a half years in solitary confinement in the Tower of London and then at Newgate. Found guilty of being a priest, he was punished by being drawn to Tyburn upon a hurdle, there to be hanged and cut down alive, his bowels to be burned before his face, his head to be stricken off, his body to be quartered and disposed at Her Majesty's pleasure. He was canonized one of the English martyrs in 1970. Among his canonical poems is The Burning Babe. During the Civil War, there were conflicts in England, Scotland, and Ireland. War-related disease alone, from war-related disease alone, England would lose almost 4% of her population. Scotland, 6%, and Ireland, 41%. Many poets of the period served on one side or the other. Vaughan, Bunyan, Wither, Herrick, Lestrange, Graham, Fairfax and their writings testify to what they witnessed. To be wounded by musket shot, even superficially, was a serious matter in an age when medical treatment consisted chiefly in amputation. Poets who risked their lives or saw their friends do so speak of the human costs in ways that foreshadow the poets of the Great War. Milton went into hiding just days before his arrest for his anti-royalist sentiments. On January 27, 1660, all known copies of Milton's books were incinerated. He spent his 57th birthday in the Tower of London, where, were it not for the intervention of friends including Marvel, he might have been executed. But he was released and went on to complete Paradise Lost. The years following his imprisonment and release were anxious ones. He lived in political ignominy, fearful of arrest, and in the Invocation of Paradise Lost Book 7, describes himself as fallen on evil days, on evil days, though fallen, and evil tongues in darkness, and with dangers compassed round and solitude. This is one of my favorite stories. It is a story of John Newton, who was conscripted to serve on board Her Majesty's ship Harwich in the Royal Navy during the War of Austrian Secession. Having attempted to escape, he was caught, put in irons, and flogged in front of other sailors with a cat of nine tails. He was then transferred to a slave trading vessel, transporting its cargo for years. 
He became responsible, among other things, for putting sailors in irons, raping female slaves, flogging rebellious slaves, and torturing small children, including on one occasion applying thumbscrews to four boys who were afterward imprisoned in neck yokes. On March 10th, 1748, he awakened in the middle of the night to find his ship breaking apart in a storm. Newton prayed for deliverance. By the following morning, the ship was heavily damaged, but most of the crew had survived. Though he continued as a slave trader until 1755, Newton began to read the Bible, committed himself to a form of evangelical Calvinism, and repented of his past, turning eventually to the abolitionist cause. In later years, he was to write the hymn, Amazing Grace. I'm going to skip ahead on some of the poet's stories to say a last thing. I know that poetry begins in a not knowing rather than a moral impulse. A poet's consciousness is, in this sense, improvisational and open to transformations, felicitous accidents, and an intuitive response to language generating meaning and music that is true, whether the spark igniting the poem comes from a word, a phrase, an image, or a moment in experience, present or remembered. This spark is what Oship Mandelstam called porif, or impulse, and what Emerson thinks of as what is oldest and best in us, the alien visitor. This not knowing is a hovering, and receptive state of consciousness without intention or conscious knowledge of direction. I also know that consciousness can be incised by experience, seared by memory, awakened by what is seen and lived, and that the poet's language also passes through this fire and is marked by it. The surrender of conscious control so necessary to the receptive artistic state does not mean that the mark of experience will not be burned into the poem and be made legible there. When we read for this mark, we read for witness and at times, along with aesthetic pleasure and the frisson of newly made meanings, we are also not perhaps persuaded but certainly transported to regions of experience that might inform our conscience so as to make art in the light of it, as the poet Marina Svetevia once proposed. Václav Havel in 1991 concluded his speech before the joint session of Congress by praising the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution of the United States as documents of enduring inspiration to the world. In closing, Havel had this to say, history has accelerated. I believe that once again it will be the human spirit that will notice this acceleration, give it a name, and transform those words into deeds. This brings me to the present, wherein we are experiencing a dizzying historical acceleration. We know that technological developments are double-edged in the sense that they enable and disable certain human capacities. The speed in communicative technology, the speed at which we are bombarded by information and imagery, at which we are expected to process it, has eroded our ability to sustain the contemplation so necessary to the creative act. We have developed a certain skittishness flitting through the web, link to link, through the labyrinths of social media at twittering speed. We're grateful that we can look up any fact, translate any word into 50 languages at once. We have enter entered Indra's luminous web of interconnection, and we also live in the midst of a tsunami of information, data, and statistics. But does this grant us knowledge and wisdom which require patient assimilation and judgment? I think 
of literary writing as a means of retrieving a human knowledge irretrievable by any other means. Composing poems and writing stories is a meditative spiritual act of resistance. It requires a capacity to sustain contemplation, to be attentive to all that is about us, and to hold within ourselves an awareness that we are here in our living moment between two unknown realms, before our births and after our deaths. We speak through art to the millennia of artists who came before us, and the art we make will send its messages to the human future. Curiosity about our predecessors and care for our descendants is a collective accomplishment. Art is what is left behind, and art is what we will leave to the world to come. We gaze at the mo same moon as the cave painters of Chauvet, even though we are now boot prints upon it. The wine-dark seas of Homer are still our seas, even if a part of their waters are now dead zones. If we retain our capacity for meditative awareness, the language of art that allows us to speak through time will not be lost. The slow, solitary engagement with music and word, paint and light, with our bodies in space and time, that is the precondition of making art, might not only preserve our capacities as artists, but as humans possessed of intuitive intelligence and inner life. Poets and artists are conversant with centuries of their kind and their visions may address the most pressing need of this epoch, that of saving the biosphere of Earth. Poetry needs no other justification. Thank you.